several years ago, I mean, I began teaching, um, first of all, in, um, in 1974 uh, at the University of Guyana. And um, I'll, I'll sit, because in discussions, that's what one does, generally. And um, I was very fortunate that after two years, I had exposure to a group from the University of London called the University of London Teaching Methods Unit. A uh, group that came to Guyana as part of a, uh, I guess, a, um, a British Council uh, uh, mechanism. And they really made a tremendous impact uh, on me. Uh, before that, I had been at a university that did not specifically have evaluations of teaching. So which many of you will go to universities that don't. <coughs> if you do, one of the first things you can do for yourself is to set up your own evaluation system. <coughs> don't say, hey, that's great, I'm at you know, University of, uh, of X that doesn't have an evaluation system. Do some kind of evaluation system, even if it's only the very simple method of at the very uh, middle of the quarter giving people a very simple sheet that says, what am I doing well and you know, what could be improved. Um, the problem with most evaluation systems where they do exist is that you get them, they're done at the end of the course, so you can't change what you're doing. And then secondly, if it's any place like Stanford, you get the results anywhere from three months to six months after the course is over, uh, by which time you can't even remember what the course was about, really, if, you're, if you have any kind of uh, decent teaching load. Um, but I had taught at, the, uh, at Johns Hopkins University one quarter, one semester, I guess, in, 19, um, in 1976. And um, I received some course evaluations that kind of made me a little unsettled. And I'm of the firm opinion that nobody teaches badly because they want to. I mean, none of us does research badly because we want to. And to the extent that we learn how to do research better, we usually um, go out and try to improve. Uh, most of the time, we have a sense that something is wrong, or evaluations tell us something is wrong, but we really don't know what to do about it. Um, so this wonderful workshop that I had was only a, a week, uh, taught me a lot of things that I have used um, throughout my teaching career since then. And to the extent that I teach well, I follow those um, principles that I learned. Um, one doesn't always follow the things that one learns, so one doesn't always teach well. But to the extent that I do, um, it's those principles that guide me. Actually, there was a little book called Improving, Improving Teaching in Higher Education, uh, which uh, they use as a text. I think it's very hard to get hold of now. And it's one of the things that I'm drawing on for my own presentation today. But let me tell you what I wanted to do first. Uh, let me give you a little outline. Um, first of all, I want to circulate. I expected a small group of about 15 or 20. So I brought some sheets of paper. Uh, I'm going to pass some around here, some around there. And when they run out, just use any sheets of paper. And I'm going to ask each of you to just write down on this sheet of paper an answer to either of two questions, or both if you like both. Uh, one, what question about discussion leading would you most like to see answered in today's session? Or what's the biggest problem you have ever experienced with discussions or with discussion leading? Okay? So if you can take a few moments to write that down. If you, don't, if you didn't get my uh, standardized uh, sheet of paper, just take your own sheet of paper. And while you're doing that, I'll just tell you what else we'll try to do. Um, the next thing we're going to do after that is have a buzz group discussion, break into some smaller groups and discuss uh, two questions. Um, one, what are the advantages and disadvantages of discussions relative to lecturing and other pedagogical methods? And then B, what are the characteristics of a good discussion? I'm not going to ask you all to discuss uh, both of them. I think I'll ask this side of the room to discuss uh, question A, and I'll ask that side of the room to discuss question B. And then we'll do some general discussion of A and B, drawing on input um, from both groups. I said here with a recorder, that is somebody to write the points down, um, but that might be kind of difficult given the logistics of, of, of this room and the way we crowded and everything. And then I'll go on to say a bit more about some specific topics, encouraging interaction, asking questions, the role of the tutor, um, and then tell you a bit about alternative small group and discussion formats, observing and evaluating discussions, and a summary, all by uh, 1 o'clock. Okay. Okay, so what I need first is to have you fill out that card or fill out a piece of paper if you don't have a card, telling me either A or B. 
what question about discussion leading would you most want today's session to answer? And then B, what is the biggest problem you've experienced with discussions or with discussion leading? Okay? So if you could just do that for me because we don't go much beyond that until you do that. And once you have done that, if you could somehow funnel those back up uh, to me, I'll take a, a look at them over here. And why don't you kind of collect over there and then just give me a stack. And uh, OK, you'll collect over there. Take another minute for that. Okay. Good, thank you. All right, we'll have some more to come dribbling in, but uh, if we just give them to Michelle, she'll get them up to me. Okay. Now, in the meantime, let's, we have um, this half of the room, we'll call this A, and this half we'll call B. And I'd like you to form buzz groups. Now, buzz groups are the single most important thing I learned in this course. Uh, the course I took from the University of London Teaching Methods Unit, uh, I guess, 20 years ago. And it's groups of two, no more than three people we're going to discuss a common topic. So the people on this side should discuss what are the advantages and disadvantages of discussions relative to lecturing and other pedagogical methods okay, in your group. And then the people on this side should discuss what are the characteristics of a really good discussion. Okay? So when I say go, I will hear this buzz of wonderful discussion. Right? <laughs> and turn and face each other and so on. You know. Introduce yourselves. Okay, um, let's try to get back and, and discuss this topic. Um, I brought along some um, papers to make tents. That is one can either use name tags or tents to identify um, yourself. And tents are, of course, these nice little triangular objects that one makes. And uh, you then try to just set it up. I've also brought along some scotch tape. Uh, we can use these to, uh, to put in front of you. Of course, difficulty is a lot of people are sitting outside rather than inside. Um, nevertheless, let's, let's try it in some way. Uh, so name tags would have been better for this group. Let me pass around some tents. And I can pass around some scotch tape on both sides. So uh, if you can write your name. And then here's some, here's some pens on this side. And uh, I have at least one pen over here. Uh, if you can just write your names, then that would help. Uh, fairly big and broad, okay? Um, and set that up uh, in front or somewhere nearby. And let's hear from the people who looked first at 
the A question. By the way, there's space all behind here, there's space over here, so come on in if you, if you wish, please. Um, what about the advantages and disadvantages of um, discussions? And what I'd like is for the groups, the little buzz groups, to just give an idea of the kinds of points that came up in your group. They may not be your opinion, they may just be things that somebody else said within your group. But uh, please go ahead now and give us some ideas of what kinds of advantages came up uh, in your groups. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was say, oh. you get more people to talk, it's more interesting the rest of Okay. Yes? In, a, in our group, um, discussing the, uh, the main advantage of the lecture is efficiency in covering materials. The main advantage of discussion is just the level of involvement. So that's very basic. Okay. Efficiency versus involvement. Okay. Lectures are efficient if the people are motivated to learn it and understand the importance of what you said. If they're not, then the efficiency is Okay, it's a question of, uh, of motivation and which one actually then affects motivation more, lecturing or, uh, or discussion leading. Um, there's also an interesting question relating to that having to do with retention, how much is retained uh, in either method. I don't know if that came up in any other groups. Yes? Um, there's a chance for students to test their own ideas in a small, small environment okay. to get feedback on them. Right. Chance for somebody to test their own ideas. What else came up? What came up over here? Long Go ahead. <laughs> um, the, the, the engagement of students. Engagement, yeah. Uh, and the, the topic came up of teaching is learning twice. Uh, that when one has the opportunity to teach to others, something personalizes the information. Um, you mean as a member of a discussion group, when you pass that information on to others, then it personalizes and maybe reinforces what your, your ideas. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. One of the concerns we had was in often the dis discussion group is that students clam up, and one of the solutions to that is what we just did here: right. break up small groups right. because people are armed when you come back together right. with with ideas to group the small group. Right. Right. Um, yes. Now, of course, we should be doing a recorder, but as I said, because of the the way this room is set up and everything, we we don't have uh, we're not going to do that. So. We hope you're making notes. And by the way, that's one of the things I didn't put down in any of my handouts. But um, I really, you have to remind people to make notes during discussions. Because a lot of people, they just kind of uh, sit back. It's like films. And you bring a film into your class, and everybody just kind of cocks back and so on. Um, and they don't ever make any notes. So uh, you need to kind of create an atmosphere in which you encourage people to make notes on discussions and points that are raised in discussions. It's very hard after you've gone. Uh, even five minutes in a discussion to remember all the issues that came up, especially in the ways that people frame them. So you really want to encourage um, your participants uh, to, to make notes um, as they came up. A little point came up there that I think we don't always remember, which is that uh, when you are in a discussion and you're getting this kind of constant feedback from the audience, you're getting a chance to see how people are learning, which is something that often as teachers we tend not to remember. You would think that we are as much concerned about learning, or ultimately learning is our big business, but we usually tend to focus on our own selves and our own little performance. So I have my lecture beautifully written, and I have my, my handouts, and I have my overheads, and so on. And ultimately, the issue is not about us. The issue is about you know, what our learners are getting out of what uh, we are doing with them in the course. And discussion gives you an opportunity to get that kind of feedback all the time, not just on midterms and exams, and so on and so forth. Um, is there any group that didn't get a chance to speak? Let me just sample somewhere behind there. Yes? Um, one problem that comes up, up often in discussion groups that come with lectures is that people feel sort of reluctant to show whether they're, um, they've done their reading assignments. They can feel <laughs> anxious about speaking up because right. they feel like they might embarrass themselves by saying something that right. shows right. they haven't done enough work. So, and that's often a, a thing that's really hard to overcome, that people are simply afraid to right. show what they what they've done. What kinds of solutions do we have to that problem? Some people mention that in these lists. 
problems of people being reticent to show knowledge or lack of knowledge. Uh, there's a related problem that some people mention, uh, how to get depth at the same time that you get involvement, because people sometimes feel that uh, people may come not having done the readings and so on. Any ideas? Yes. Breaking a larger group up into smaller groups mm -hmm. makes shy people feel more comfortable about contributing. Okay, so doing some version of, of buzz groups to begin with um, is helpful, uh, especially if in the buzz groups the understanding is that you are not personally responsible for the points that you make. Um, so that if you have a buzz group of three or four people, you're talking about issues that came up in your group without necessarily claiming ownership. Okay. Um, the other thing uh, that one can do, um, and I'm kind of accelerating here so we can, I'd like to discuss all of these issues, but to kind of help us get through. Um, sometimes one can link a discussion to a prior assignment, especially a prior written assignment. Um, so if you ask people, for instance, to do this, uh, to, you, know, you use this technique in which you ask people to write some notes, so write a squib, write a reaction to a particular assigned reading, and to bring it uh, for submission on that particular day. Um, by and large, students will then have done the reading, and they'll come somewhat better prepared. And in fact, the thing that you ask them to write about may be the same kind of thing you ask them to discuss. So at that point, they tend to come with a little more background um, than when you know, the syllabus just says, read pages 10 to 20 or 10 to 100, uh, and, um, and you're then expecting them to have done that when they come in. Yes? Yeah, excuse me, I used that before, and it works really well when okay. you're focusing on, say, one article okay. for your discussion session. Right. What I found, though, is that usually, I mean, especially with the quarter system, you're assigning multiple articles to be discussed in a weekly session, mm -hmm. and then I would assign, just as you're suggesting, right. um, maybe four or five discussion questions, one of which was actually to be turned in in a written form. Mm -hmm. And when we discussed that question, we had incredible discussion. Right. But since the other ones were not turned in, they didn't even look at the other questions. Right. Any solutions to that? Any ideas about that? <laughs> I missed the last part of what you said. Um, just because students turn in every question doesn't mean you have to read all the answers. Right, no, 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 no. But I think it's not just a question of reading. You're saying that. Well, um, be, I mean, it'd be a lot of work to ask the students to prepare like five right. just written two page things. Right. It's not well, possible. There's a solution to that, yes. A uh, couple of thoughts. One is you could divide the group and have different parts of the class right. assigned to each question. That's right. The other thing you can do is have them hand in one and let it be know, known over time that you're always asking them to discuss a different one right. instead of keeping them uncertain. Right. Or you could do a variation. Those are b both good suggestions. You could do a variation of the things some people do for, for exams where they say um, the exam will be on one of these five questions. Um, and people then really do go off and try to prepare them all. Um, that's, that's a challenge, a, a very particular kind of challenge that's different from many regular discussions where you don't necessarily require knowledge. Um, sometimes it's good to, in fact, frame your discussions in ways that don't necessarily require knowledge of the reading. Uh, for instance, as a resident fellow, we often assign freshmen a book to read over the summer. And of course, they're the conscientious ones who come back with you know, every page with highlighter and so on and so forth. But then there are the others who clearly uh, you know, just picked it up in the bookstore the morning of the discussion or something. Um, and so we try to include questions that may relate to the larger issues that are raised in the book, but don't necessarily uh, require a knowledge of every single point um, that's raised on every page. Now, you still want to include in the discussion some topics that allow the people who have done the deeper kind of, of reading uh, to kind of display that and to raise the issues displayed there. But at that point, the other people can kind of just try to look interested uh, or something, uh, and you can have a bit, uh, a, a different parts of the discussion for different people. Of course, I think a lot of times we tend to be afraid of free reign. Um, it's partly because it usurps our, our, our role, or because, and this is a point I'm going to make a little later, but I may as well make it now, you don't want to be accused of not teaching. You know, as a teacher, <laughs> I'm the one in charge. I know the stuff. You know, uh, knowledge flows downhill or whatever. Um, and um, I guess you're afraid that if you do too much of this stuff, people may say, well, does he really know anything? You know, I mean, he just kind of <laughs> sits there and nods and, and, and recognizes different people. And it takes a lot of confidence to not be afraid of that. Uh, one of the things that's often amazing when you have a very good discussion going is how, um, when it goes very well, 
people can end up coming up with many of the points that you wanted to make. I mean, you could almost have your own little checklist and scratch off uh, many of them. And then at the end, there may only be two or three other points that you, you have to make. In fact, this is partly what I'm doing here with this technique. I mean, I could have just dealt with the first part of this presentation by saying, you know, pluses and minuses of, um, of discussions uh, using, you know, my own experience and the books I have and so on. But I think a lot of the points that I would want to make and a lot of points that the books make have already been made in one form or another by people in the group. And when they arise out of this kind of uh, group participation and group discussion, they tend to be you know, much more deeply felt, much more strongly believed, uh, much more clearly understood um, than just presenting a very long lecture. Please come in, by the way. There's barely a space all of behind here. And uh, I feel bad to see people kind of standing up outside. Any other disadvantages? You were talking about how effective you deal with digression. Digressions, right. Um, how do you deal with digressions? Anybody, you needn't have been an A group, you know, you guys all have some expertise. How do you deal with digressions? Anybody? Yes. Response, the digressive response, off another student. You can see if that other student calls right back. Sometimes it works. Sometimes okay. Kind of a reflector uh, uh, approach. Yes. Right. Okay. Any other suggestions? I think at some point it just have to practice the discussion structure and people stick to the structure. You have to take a style and just approach it so Okay. Right, so she's saying we have to crack the whip. Of course, you don't necessarily take a Stalinist approach, right? <laughs> I mean, typically what lecturers do, what, what's the favorite phrase that we use? That's very, very, that's very interesting. That's very interesting <laughs> point, Jim. But uh, can we get back to the other issue that we were dealing with? Yeah. Um, yes? You can actually say that without, if you leave the butt out, it probably has a different tone to it. So if you say, for instance, uh, that, you know, that's a very interesting point. Now, and then just go back to the other thing without right. the, so the little words like but, like right. that can kind of target to the person that they've been sort of, you know, put, put off down, in some way. I'll yeah. Put off or put down. Yes, you're right. Sometimes, of course, it really is interesting. It's just not today's topic. You can say, you know, so we really will talk about this uh, next week and, you know, keep those thoughts and, and do bring them again next week and, and so on and so forth. Um, let's just turn over here uh, and see what people consider uh, characteristics of a good discussion. So, um, any good? Not just a TA or a few students. Okay, many people talking. Right? That probably is a, the, the thing that came up most often on these sheets, or at least the converse. You know, nobody talks. And I say, let's discuss this, and nobody talks. Okay? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes. Phrasing uh, the topic in using as examples items that are relevant to the people in the group. So phrasing your topic with their experience. Okay. So that's at least the beginning, uh, at the beginning phase. Uh, presumably, um, what we would mean is that as a discussion proceeds, um, your, your topics or, the, or your concerns do get maybe addressed, but from their perspectives. Right? And I think a lot of times we have, to, we have to be prepared for it coming out somewhat differently than how we um, you know, initiated it. Because I mean, that's precisely the point, that you have ideas and knowledge being filtered through many different minds. I mean, that's the whole value of discussion, or one of the values of discussion. OK, what else? What else makes a good discussion? Yeah. Um, whether or not it sticks to the agenda you had, at the end, being able to summarize the main points of the discussion, and bringing, letting the students leave the discussion with some main points in their head so they don't okay. feel like it just ended without some kind of closure. OK. Good summary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not just having people present their own ideas, but responding to one another's ideas. Sort of okay. hinging in on what other people have already said. Listening, right. Yes. That's what our group was saying, that it isn't just that everyone should talk, but that they should talk to each other mm -hmm. uh, and listen mm -hmm. to what people are saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Important that people in discussion simply don't agree with one another out of a, a reticence to speak their mind, that there be some honest give and take and difference of opinion. Okay. So honesty. Yes. 
Okay. Sorry. We thought that the most important thing uh, that sort of runs through a lot of things that have been said is that you have a comfortable environment where everybody feels free to participate, um, where nobody is sort of being consistently left out or is hesitating to talk. Mm -hmm. I was just adding, actually adding to those two points, we're creating an atmosphere where uh, people feel safe to express their honest opinion so that they, they know that the, um, they can share those things without being attacked. Mm -hmm. yes. I can relate to what the other group said too. Uh, there's a Lao Tzu quote that says, you know, uh, effective leaders are, are those who, uh, are, when it's done, the, the people feel like they did it themselves. And uh, might mean that you're evaluations say things like, you know, you were lazy and that you didn't know what you were doing, but that, might, that, might, but that still might be the most important I have thought. never said that. Uh, um, anybody who does discussions, and lots of discussions in the uh, class, yeah, there's that quote you were talking about, of a good leader when his task, and I, I've tried to keep saying his, her, and so on, you know, these, these things were written a while ago, uh, or, or was, was said a while ago, you know, of a good leader when his task is finished, his goal achieved, they say, we did this ourselves. Okay, so that's, that's in fact, Relates very nicely to the to the role um, of the uh, the role of the of the uh, discussion leader. Um, a lot of good points came up here so far. Uh, some of them we're going to try to cover as we go through. Um, I'm going to try to move a little more quickly. And at this point, I am going to give out uh, my my handout um, since I no longer am in danger of influencing the discussion in a negative way. Um, just take a look at at those quotations that I have. Um, on the first page uh, because I think they get at a lot of the deeper values and deeper experiences that people tend to have more with discussion than they tend to have uh, with, with lecturing um, and is one of the motivations for really trying to perfect your art of discussion leading. Um, the fact that it very often seems to uh, produce more imaginative thinking, it tends to produce more excitement. Um, more interest tends to tends to make people uh, set up and be sit up and be more highly motivated uh, than other kinds of uh, other kinds of teaching, um, and you have at the end uh, from Rogers, 1969. I've come to feel that the only learning um, which uh, significantly influences behavior is self self-discovered, self-appropriated um, learning. Um, I'm going to go very quickly now to some points, some, some suggestions that uh, I can make drawn on my own experience and drawn uh, also from the references which you have at the end of this handout um, that uh, deal with some of the problems that people commonly encounter in discussion leading uh, and in fact are some of the things that came up in these uh, sheets that you provided for me. Uh, I'm going to put some of these things up here on the overhead, uh, primarily for the benefit of people who might be watching the broadcast later on and not have access to our, um, not have access to our, uh, to our handout. So probably the first most important thing for encouraging interaction is to get the right kind of room. It can be very hard. It's very hard at Stanford. Uh, we have many rooms that are set up for lectures with nice fixed fix chair seating. Um, much harder to find a room like this, okay? Uh, much harder to find a room that has movable seats so that you can kind of create a circle. Um, avoid doing what we're doing here today, that is sitting or standing at the head of the table, right? I mean, because of the equipment, because of the way this is set up. Um, somebody who comes in, in a sense, knows right away that I am leading this discussion, right? And it's also one of the reasons why uh, the kind of discussion we've had so far all your questions and feedback have been coming to me. Right? Um, it's partly because of the size of the group. It's hard to do a discussion with 50 people. Um, but ideally, you, know, you should consistently resist you know, the head chair at the table and sit somewhere in the middle and, you know, in a sense, just be another uh, Joe or Jane uh, as a way of facilitating discussion. Um, use things like these name tags uh, or you know, little tents so that people know who they're talking to. I mean, you know, Fred and Marianne and Ronaldo and so on, um, rather than just you know, the guy with the blue tie or, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, point D uh, has to do with um, what you do while people are speaking. Um, and there are somewhat different opinions. Some people say, of course, it's very important to show this kind of engaged interest in the one person. 
and you want to do a measure of that. Um, but that can be really intimidating for some people too. You know, the, everybody's attention is focused on you. So sometimes uh, uh, what people suggest is in fact, you know, you look at the person, but you also glance around the group so that the person feels a little less pressure on them and so that you're sensitive to, to what other people may be trying to say or wanting to say. That's the only way you can kind of pick up feedback from the group about who wants to go next. Um, use the method that I've tried to use to some extent today, uh, the Socratic method. Um, it's very easy when people ask questions to say, you know, here's the answer, all right? Uh, it really takes discipline to say, but what do you think? And of course, maybe the first few times you try it, they kind of laugh at you. Uh, but um, it really becomes a habit to try and get them to figure things out for themselves. Now, obviously, you can, you, you'll come in to kind of add some information to modify an answer, but you really want to encourage them to think things through for themselves, okay? The more you do that, the more involved they are. You, know, you look at any class that has good discussion and people are awake, especially in these evening sections, which are so popular at Stanford. Uh, people come after a meal and so on. If you just talk at them for an hour, chances are they'll start to nod and doze off in the corners. If they get a chance to, 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 to talk uh, and be involved, um, it's very hard to sleep and talk at the same time. Okay. Um, F, avoid the temptation to reject or correct a student's contribution, right, which can be often very in inhibiting. You might invite him or her to elaborate or to reconsider. Is that really so? Uh, ask for others' opinions. What do you think, uh, Dagfin? Uh, or what does anyone else think about that? Um, now, sometimes there are things that are just flat out wrong, and you may want to correct them. Uh, actually, discussion leading is a, is, a, is, is a very complex skill because you're actually doing many things at once. You may not want to respond right away and say, you know, what Joe said, you know, is just ridiculous. It's just totally flat out wrong. Uh, you may want to say, well, okay, let's think about that for a moment, take another point. But you have it in the back of your mind that you want to get back to this point. So at some stage later in the discussion, hopefully not too far along, uh, you'll say, well, actually, the way people actually went about this problem is this and this and this and this. So you can kind of correct this without necessarily saying, you know, that uh, awful student in the corner over there is the one who uh, said that this, this obtained and this is definitely wrong. Um, G is, you know, avoid stating your own um, opinion too rigidly, uh, although one can sometimes make a strong or outrageous statement in order to stimulate um, good argument. Uh, a lot depends on what you're trying to do and what kinds of discussion you're trying to mediate. You know, if you have a general discussion in the dorms about uh, you know, three strikes uh, or about capital punishment or Prop 209, um, you may want, in fact, to kind of hold back on, uh, on some of your opinions a lot. Um, for some academic issues, it may, in fact, be good to take a very strong position on one side and deliberately invite people to take an opposing kind of position. Uh, Time out when appropriate. Depends how long the discussion is. Calling time out when appropriate. I think my batteries are dying, fast dying on me here. Um, so this, oh, here it is. Time out when appropriate to review progress or process or to change direction. So this is very helpful in cases where uh, people feel you decide to go off course a bit, right? Or if things have gotten too hostile, or if things have, are too placid, <laughs> okay? You might say, as someone said, you know, well, what do you really think? Because you know, this discussion is just going along too nicely. I'm not getting any kind of heart and guts uh, in this discussion. Um, and finally, again, for the, for the benefit of those who are looking on TV, uh, give dominant students alternative roles, like note taker. Okay? Uh, uh, Frank, you've been doing such a good job. If you could make some notes on the points that are taking, uh, that, that we'll be discussing, um, that may help. Uh, and of course, looking at and recognizing others. You have to be careful of that because sometimes Frank is very dominant, but next to him is, you know, Bill, who may be very quiet. And if you just stop avoiding, if you just avoid looking at that part of the room, you may leave out Bill uh, altogether. And then notice reticent students seek out their opinions. Uh, the next point I make here about going around the room is one that people have different opinions on. People sometimes say, well, you know, it really puts people on the spot. If I say, well, at this point in the discussion, I'd like to go around this room and I'd like to ask everybody just to say, 
make one comment on this reading or this issue. Okay. Um, I guess I have found more in my experience that I'm amazed that this person who really had said nothing up to this point had, in fact, a well-formulated, insightful point to make. Uh, so I would prefer to err on the side of, you know, maybe putting them a bit on the spot. But to some extent, I mean, that's what education is about. I mean, uh, asking people to refine their ideas, to state their ideas, to change their ideas. So I'd prefer to say that um, with the understanding that you're not going to belabor it. So that if, you know, if Fred doesn't want to speak very long or he just makes a little point, we just say thanks and we, we move on, you know. Um, Okay, let's turn now quickly to asking questions. And again, I have uh, a number of, of, of points there. Uh, the first is, of course, to have a good idea beforehand of the objectives of the discussion. I mean, this really means so much. I mean, and the other thing that I learned from the University Teaching Methods Unit um, is the importance of, at the beginning of every course, asking yourself, what are my objectives? Right? Most of us really never take the time to do that. Uh, and in fact, in a really good course, those objectives are spelled out somewhere in the course, not only in terms of abstract things like learning to see alternative points of view, but being able to do A, B, C, and D. Okay? Um, obviously, if you really wanted to get some critical concept uh, here, then that's going to be a somewhat different objective from getting them to think through different sides uh, of an issue. Um, so your lead-off questions are often very important. You may take uh, you know, interesting quotations from the readings that people are doing, or you may, in fact, invite people to come with questions. So some variation of the kind of, of technique uh, that we did here. Avoid fishing expedition questions. You all know what those are. I got into it in one or two of my questions earlier, where you know exactly what you want to hear, and, and they're all just trying to guess it. And it's, it's very frustrating for both parties. <laughs> Uh, you may as well tell them what you want to tell them and, uh, or just ask about other things that are more interesting. Uh, obviously, ask WH questions, why, what, how, rather than simple yes, no questions. Ask questions that, um, point D, that elicit responses at the higher ends of Bloom's taxonomy, you know, the, the, the conceptual uh, ends, uh, the, the, the end that has to do with, with comparing, with evaluating, rather than uh, saying what's right and what's wrong. Um, Point E, very hard for TAs, very hard for professors. Once you've asked the question, don't be afraid to wait for an answer. Okay? Um, I know it gets awkward, uh, but if you always fill the silences, you will never get an answer. Because, okay, well, we know John Rickford has about 3.3 seconds, and then he's going to chip in. Okay? <laughs> if it gets too oppressive, go back to buzz groups. I mean, the, the nice thing about buzz groups is that when you say discuss, there is buzzing. Now, you hope most of the time that they're, in fact, talking about the issue that you asked them to talk about and not about the big game or, or something else. Um, but it tends to work, and it tends to loosen people up. Uh, and then finally, read and give nonverbal cues. You can often ask a question with a glance. Okay? Or um, again, looking around the room, it's very important for you to be able to read the cues that people are giving off, you know, when they're getting bored, when they're getting excited, when it looks as though they may have something to say, but they're never really getting a chance um, to say it. OK, now the role of the tutor, which we've, we've, we've already said something about. Uh, and I just lost my, my, my overhead. Um, I'm not sure where that one went. Uh, but the role of the tutor, um, I have it said, I've said it here fairly simply. The biggest obstacle is, is the fear that you will not be seen as an authority, that people are going to write uh, on your evaluations. Uh, you know, he had many discussions, but he never taught us anything. Uh, if you are doing discussion leading well, okay, then in fact a lot of the key issues will come up, and people will be far more stimulated and excited. Uh, very often, when I say in my kind of midterm evaluations what's going well, people say discussions. I like when you break us up and let us interact. 